Welcome into the Monday edition of the KSO show. We've got a chalk toss from DY to start it off. No actual chalk, just the the invisible chalk that Avery Johnson tossed on Saturday night. Uh, you could tell after the first touchdown, it, that was what you would expect from a freshman quarterback. He ran it in and he immediately just turned around. It's kind of like, what do I do with the ball? Where's the ref? And it just took all of his teammates kind of going over there and slapping him. He definitely, at some point, though, got told by his teammates, like, you got to do something after you score. Uh, kind of like, you remember Ben Sennett last year where there was all this discussion about how he hadn't scored a touchdown, and then he didn't know what to do when he finally did score. I think Baylor uh, was his first touchdown last year. He got two of them there. Uh, and so then from that point forward, he just he started doing, like, the LeBron, like, pushing down type thing. So. Yeah. Uh, Avery Johnson makes it in there. Uh, that was a, a big game for him and a big game for the Wildcats as they secured the win against Texas Tech uh, by the score of 38-21 to 21 on Saturday night in Lubbock. That was, uh, it was a good game for all looks, involved. I was going to say, it, it looks like I lost again. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you know, sorry my about my, my defense is lacking. <laughs> yeah, you gotta you gotta defend a little bit harder and a little bit better uh, in the weeks to come. Uh, before we dive into our overs and unders from the weekend and recap the game that way, uh, give maybe one or two quick initial thoughts on how the game played out and, and maybe what it means moving forward for the Wildcats. For the second year in a row, Kansas State ran the crap out of the ball against Texas Tech with the quarterback also for the second year in a row. The Red Raiders had their quarterbacks take a beating. Uh, Kansas State didn't tackle well, but they forced turnovers and beat the crap out of their quarterbacks. And ultimately, that was good enough on the defensive side of the ball to affect their passing game. Need to tackle better, as I said. Offensively, need to throw a little bit better. We'll see if maybe the threat of the QB run can open up things in the passing game moving forward. And best game of the year for Trey Shawford. Yes, Treshawn Ward, a very big part of the game on Saturday. Obviously, everybody's focus goes on Avery Johnson, but Treshawn Ward was the leading rusher in the game, and it it kind of confirmed what we assumed going into the season, which was going to be this is probably a hot hand scenario. Each running back is going to have their games where they are the guy, and by the end of the year, it's all probably going to even out, and then DJ Giddens had the massive game against UCF. Treshawn Ward was banged up a little bit. Nobody really played well against Oklahoma State. And so maybe we thought, hey, DJ Giddens is the guy. Well, Treshawn Ward came out and he proved that he, in fact, can be the guy when you need him. So big game for him, big game for the Wildcats, and uh, they get the victory in Lubbock. It's funny. We're After the game, we're like, oh, my gosh, quarterback situation. Who's going to start? Who's going to start? Avery Johnson or Will Howard? No one's saying running back. Which is the same situation. I mean, yeah. come on, yeah, come on. Yeah, true. Yeah, run. There's a there's a running back controversy that K State has. Nobody's talking about that. Uh, maybe that's how maybe that's how we stand out from everybody else uh, in K State media. We talk about the issues that matter. The K State running back controversy. That would be uh, maybe the way to go. Look, I, I think uh, we know both guys are going to have their moments, and it's going to be kind of fun to see how it plays out. Uh, also, real quick, just to kind of throw this out for everybody and how it ends up going down, the last two years, uh, K-State quarterbacks have now ran for, let's see, that would be 200 or 261 yards against Texas Tech. Adrian Martinez went for 171 last year. Avery Johnson, just over half of that, but still very good number at 90 and five touchdowns in the game, which was the K-State record. The 380 number I heard, I think, came from fan, and I think it was rushing yards in general the last yeah. two times that they played Texas Tech. So the Red Raiders apparently, um, apparently, Kansas State sees something in the Texas Tech run defense. Yeah, I believe, I believe what he uh, is saying there is the average yardage total on the ground for K State because they were, I mean, they went off last year against them. K State ran for 343, so maybe not. In the 380 oh, maybe range, but maybe total yards. 580, 580. Yeah. yeah, that sounds about right then. Yeah, total. I mean, well, they've been almost, phenomenal. Almost 600 yards rushing against Texas Tech the last two years. Yeah, and and Tech fans are not happy about it because uh, they uh, 
just immediately thought this happens all the time against K-State. Some quarterback just runs all over us. I, I do like that they've given up 600 rushing yards, essentially, to Kansas State the last two seasons, and they're pissed at their offensive coordinator. Yes. <laughs> yeah, good point. Yeah, you gave up 38 points. Um <laughs> I don't against a true freshman quarterback. I don't know that the problem is on the offense here. Zach uh, Shitley, right? Is that what they're calling yeah, him? Yeah. Yes. Uh, that is an affectionate name that they've started to dole out to their offensive coordinator down there. And I think the other thing that gets lost in this, this and this is more of a maybe like a, a national conversation or a regional conversation, but uh the talk about, well, Texas Tech was down to their third string quarterback. They were playing a true freshman in the game. So, you know, how much does that mean for what K State did with their win? Again, and I think they understand that Avery Johnson is a freshman quarterback, but it's like you're treating them differently. Um, I would, I'm trying to think of a, a nice analogy that doesn't offend people. So I'm not going to say anything to try and, you know, paint this picture clearly. Uh, Cause I think I could say something uh, like with my past experiences and people be like, uh, that's not very good of you. So I'm going to steer clear, but like Avery Johnson is being viewed in a different lens than what Jake strong was, even though they are the same, they are both true freshman quarterbacks and Avery Johnson had massive success against Texas tech and strong struggled against K state. That's not K state's problem. And that is an element to why K-State had success. And, I mean, K-State was doing fine against Baron Morton as well. And, you know, Taj Brooks was talked about a ton going into the game. Outside of a few big runs, K-State did a really good job of kind of shutting that down. And Joey McGuire talked about it after the game. Um, sorry that we didn't have the video for anybody asking. Uh, Joey McGuire talked about it after the game. It was just like, yeah, I mean, you know, we got a couple big runs, but they, they shut us down well enough to where, like, we couldn't just keep doing that. And they wanted to test K-State, and obviously you had a guy that just wasn't ready to make decisions to throw the ball successfully. But what The only thing I – and we can get right into the over-unders after this. So this is probably my final and, and fleeting point, I would say, is that I take issue with the fact – and one of these people being Ian Boyd, who covers Texas for on three, was saying, you know what, you know, Texas Tech – this game doesn't look like this if Texas Tech is their starting quarterback, essentially. Yeah. Um, and he used probably more colorful language that is a little bit even more dramatic than, than saying that. My thing is, is like, yes, Kansas State was the fortunate party there to defend a backup quarterback, but Kansas State is a backup quarterback, too. So, cry me a river for one. Two, can Kansas State get a little bit of credit for that? Not that they're trying to injure someone, but they beat the crap out of the quarterback because the front played so well. Yeah, I mean, and, and to be honest, I loved it because what I thought was lacking in the losses was a little bit of heart, a little bit of passion, a little bit of physicality. And what I said in the preview on point, I don't, for those that have read, thank you. For those that didn't, I said it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world if Kansas State got a penalty in this game for knocking somebody in the mouth because somebody needs to do that. And, and I thought they did that against Texas Tech. You're right, and and they they did. I mean, it it came early, and that was one of the things that I've talked about a lot this year. I thought that specifically the pass rush, even though it had been good at times, it was sporadic when it good. It came in bunches, and it wasn't coming early enough in games. From the very jump, they were all over Baron Morton, and even though they weren't piling up sacks in the game or tackles for loss, they were hitting him hard. I mean, I, I have plenty of highlight videos from the first half where you know Taj Brooks is trying to run the ball, and somebody's stepping up, and maybe they're not stopping him behind the line, but right there at the line or a yard or two past, he's getting popped by somebody. I mean, one of the guys I have on there is Colby McAllister coming up and making a big hit even. So these guys were all over the place for K-State, and it, it took a toll on Texas Tech. And Baron Morton was obviously a guy that felt it. Joey McGuire called it an accumulation of injuries uh, is what knocked him out for the second half of the game, and uh, K-State was the benefactor of it, and that's football. That is going to happen at times. And, you know, like you said, you're not trying to injure anybody. Like, that's not what K-State is doing. But it is a physical game, and you will have an accumulation of injuries at various points if you keep getting knocked back. And that is just one of the benefits and fortunate breaks that you can get if you're the opponent. If you keep going after somebody, they may not be able to take it physically much more. And that puts you in a good spot. So I, I think that that's a, a very good thing you bring up. Let's dive into the over-unders now. 
to uh, recap the game with Texas Tech and K-State a whole lot better. Uh, Drew, keeping track of our standings heading into this week, I was in the lead 18-10 and 10 on the season. D.Y. and Drew tied at 17-11. and 11. The separation, not a ton of it was created this week uh, because we actually had a handful that we got wrong. I wouldn't say anybody had a good week by any stretch of the imagination. But the first one on the docket, K-State total plays 72.5. We all took the over. My logic for it on, on Friday when we talked about it was just I felt like this was going to have to be a methodical game for K-State to win it. Number one, they weren't forcing turnovers. They did that. Number two, they weren't having great success offensively. It felt like one of those games where Will Howard was going to have to be very just, you know, methodical and, hey, this is a five-yard pass to Ben Sennett, this and that. And K-State was able to score a lot of points and get some big plays, but it wasn't from Will Howard. It was a totally different game plan than what we would have expected because we didn't know that Avery Johnson was going to play to that extent. Neither did the K-State coaches. So we all uh, wear it on the chin for that one because the Wildcats only rattled off 64 plays in the game on Saturday. That's not very many. <laughs> that's all I got. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's uh, it's, it is not very many. Uh, but, you know, they, they ended up working it out. And I, I think you'll take it. I, I don't think that there are any issues with how uh, things ended up working for the Wildcats in probably, that game. Probably more plays this week against this team. And, and I got got it shipped for this game, but the wow. TCU helmet is in. The black one. I don't know if they're wearing black, but it's that's what I got. All right. Well, the, I, the, the prop work is great here. Eventually, you're going to have your house is going to look like the the ESPN locker that stores all the helmets they get. Sent. Yeah. Or, or that person's front yard. Remember that video with all those helmets <laughs> in the front yard? Like, yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. I mean, maybe it'll look like that. Uh, Got, I got I got the Oklahoma State one on the other side of this, so yeah. I don't know, no one wants to see that. Let's so. see. Yeah, you got K State, Mizzou, Illinois out there. Shout out to Illinois, hey, big win, big win for Eli Nine. Yeah, shout out, shout yep. out, Alec, Alec Bussy, big win for Eli. RIP, not dead. Uh, what you got? <laughs> Pitt too. Pitt, big win up there. I put some big winners. I got hey, I got, I took I brought out Penn State this week too on the other side. Big oh, game wow. against the Buckeyes who are, who uh, are on you, the top. I, is, is that Penn State or Mill Valley? It's the blandest, boringest helmet I've ever seen. Yeah, they can't even put their logo on. So I think you could have just walked into a random store and bought a white helmet and said, yeah, I got Penn State. Uh, did, it pain did. You to, did it pain you to buy a Michigan helmet and stick it down there? Or is yeah. that Delaware? No, that's uh, I should say it's Delaware. Ohio State's on the top with the Green Bay Packers. You put the best mm -hmm. ones on the top, so that's why you okay. can't see those. Um, you got Texas Tech that took a fat L this week, obviously. Yeah, Houston. Uh, yeah, Houston, who big win over West Virginia. Yeah. Shout out to Houston Cougars and North Carolina undefeated. How about that? Okay. All right. Well, we're just going to call that the winner's wall then. Uh, that's <laughs> what it looks like this week. And it's good that K State is still on the winner's wall after uh, how oh, everything yeah. played out. This is, we got Mizzou right there. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Big win over Kentucky. Know. I guess that's good for K-State's resume. I mean, if this was basketball, you'd be like, yeah, that's good. It's good. That's a good win come March uh, <laughs> or a good loss come March. I don't know that it matters much in football, but other than perception. All right, moving on. K-State yards per play. Five and a half was the number that was set. This is where K-State was really good. I mean, we, we talked about they ran a lot less plays than we anticipated, but they put up 6.8 yards per play. We all took the over here. Um, I didn't really give a, a good theory to why I did. I tried doing a bunch of math in my head. I was just like, well, given how many plays I think they'll run, they'll need like 400 some yards. Uh, they didn't run that many plays, so they didn't necessarily need that many yards. They still got over 400. I think the final tally ends up being 436 yards, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yeah, uh, yes. for K State. So uh, I was Actually trying to do outgained. math. Actually got outgained. Yeah. Um, it's kind of a killer when your quarterback throws a little fly ball to, to Kobe Savage in the end zone. Uh, we it's all took the over of, there. Kind of, it's kind of a killer when he throws another fly ball to Kobe mm. Savage that he dropped before yeah. that. <laughs> That's killer for both of those guys. Uh, wh what did you make of K-State's offense then and how they were able to, to, to move the ball in bigger chunks uh, this week? And a lot of that had to do with the legs of Avery Johnson, who made some big plays and just, you know, he turned first down pickups into – walk-in touchdowns multiple times in the game against Texas Tech? I would just say efficiency kind of rules the day offensively. You, 
First off, he ran for 273 yards on 5.9 yards to carry. Pretty good um, the last time I checked. Ben Sinnott, talk about efficiency, six targets, six catches. Phillip Brooks, five targets, four catches. So, again, efficiency, more efficiency. Avery Johnson, eight of nine through the air. Will Howard, hey, let's 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 not slam Will mm-hmm. Howard. We don't have to do that to prop up Avery Johnson, right? I think – that's a good point to make. Six of nine. That's a good day at the office. So 14 of 18 combined for the two quarterbacks. 5.9 yards to carry. Senate, six catches on six targets. Phil Brooks, four catches, five targets. Efficiency, efficiency, efficiency. Interesting to note, a lot of these numbers are pretty similar. Like I said this on the Three Mall podcast. Kansas State, 23 first downs. Texas Tech, 23 first downs. Kansas State, five penalties for 45 yards. Texas Tech, five penalties for 45 yards. The total yards differential, only 40 yards difference. Average yards per play, K-State, a little over six and a half. Texas Tech, a little below six and a half. Average yards of rush, Kansas State, almost six. Texas Tech, a little over six. Another big key, but another similarity, red zone. Kansas State, 4 of 4. Texas Tech, 3 of 4. That one possession, you go 3 of 4, probably matters in this type of game. But the biggest differential, and why it doesn't matter that these stats are close, we alluded to it, Texas Tech, 3 turnovers, Kansas State, 0. Well, and and here's another thing that that plays into this. Last week in Stillwater for K-State, they only had 11 what would be considered big plays, according to stat broadcast, so runs over 10, pass plays over 15. They only had 11 of those. They had 16 of them this week in their game. Good point. Um, Got this, I think, from Cole, who maybe got it from KSU underscore fan. Don't know. Um, That's a conspiracy theory of mine. (laughs) Treshawn Ward, you talk about those – Run plays over 10, pass plays, you said, over 15, over 20, whatever. Mm-hmm. Trajan Ward, six runs over 10 yards. And we'll, we'll talk about him in a second, but I think one of the, the underrated biggest plays of the game was when it was, you know, yeah. it was se- second and 15 or third and 15, and he, and he just picks it up for you. He had a, a – or come, came up just short. He had a big run there in the middle of the yep. field that spurred things on, and he was really good. And I, I think, you know – we talked about the Giddens and the Ward thing. It was just not DJ Giddens night. I would say that he just didn't see the field well enough. Texas Tech's defense was better equipped to stop him than it was Trayshawn Ward because Giddens was doing a lot of, and Drew said it after the game, there was a lot of east and west to his game. And that number one really isn't the type of runner that he should be. And it just was, I think, a field vision thing. But Trayshawn Ward had it on Saturday night against Texas Tech. And he was able to just put it into practice because a lot of those runs he has, I mean, normally we would think of Ward as the shifty guy, just kind of doing everything to to shake a guy. He just saw the hole and immediately ran straight through it. He was running straight most of the time, and it worked out for him quite a bit, and he was really good. One other thing I'll point out on terms of the yards per play, K-State last week, they ran 72 plays, and that was when they, they ended up with only uh, 11 big plays in the game. Then they had, obviously, we just covered it. They only ran 64 plays this week, and 16 of them uh, end up going for big plays. So 25% of K-State's plays ran were big plays. Matt, uh, if you didn't point out, I was going to. I was like, man, that's a solid round number. I like those. Yeah, I know. I was trying to think in my head. I was like, can I access my calculator fast enough to do this? And I started thinking, I was like, wait. Now, this is an easy number. And It's like that Brian Brian Windhorse meme, like, Yes. Uh, you talked about Texas Tech and their yards per play and how I think you said it ended up being more than K-State, actually. Um, uh, a little less. Uh, well, your, okay. Their yards per rush was a little more. Yards per rush was a little bit more. Texas Tech, despite outgaining K-State, their big plays, they only had eight of them in the game. So K-State doubled Double up Texas in the big plays department, and that's significant, and that's another reason why K-State was able to do it, where obviously Tech had their moments and they had some, you know, movement down the field pretty deep but they didn't always get the big plays when they needed them k-state that's where they were so much better this week is they got the big plays when they needed them for the most part and and that's that's beneficial for them 
when Texas Tech missed on two fourth downs, I think one was deep in their own territory. That wasn't ideal. Um, yeah. They ran 15 more plays. Another long distance to go run. You talk about a – was it a second or a third and long with Treshawn Ward? Third and long for Avery Johnson on what I believe was a 30-yard touchdown run. Yeah. That was, that was third and ten. And – they ran basically QB power, QB sweep. Uh, I forget what the exact scheme was. It's designed QB run behind pullers on third and 10 at the 30-yard line, and he scores without being touched against the heavy box. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> they, yeah. They, they had nine in the box. It's about it and stop them. And that was the run where uh, Texas Tech fans – they they said yeah it was like we only had nine guys on the field trying to defend that play yeah you had eleven but you had nine in the box by the way that shows you what they thought of the Kansas State pass offense kind of cringe a little bit that on third and ten they were still ready to defend the run <laughs> yeah exactly and they they still couldn't stop it so chalk that up to the to the, the greatness of the blocking for the most part yep. on Saturday night. And then also, obviously, the talent of Avery Johnson. Okay, Treshawn Ward, over under 12 and a half touches. We all took the under in this game, and we all basically just said, hey, this is going to be a heavy DJ Giddens game. Well, it became the opposite of that, but that's okay in the grand scheme of things for K-State. Uh, Ward ended up with 15 carries. Uh, I didn't even bother to check once I saw how many carries he had, if he, he had any. No catch. No, no catch. catch. Okay, there you go. Um he stepped up and, and played am amazingly for K State. Just what they needed. Ended up with 15 carries for 118 yards. Um, for as good of the night as Avery Johnson had, and he had all the touchdowns to go with it. And he no doubt, you know, spurred on the Wildcats to a win. Treshawn Ward was equally as big in that game on Saturday night, and he deserves a lot of props. And that's a really good thing for K State to have over the last six games of the season. We've talked about it a lot already, whether it's been, you know, Saturday after the game, Sunday, whenever. You now have a moment where if a guy just doesn't have it, you don't have to try and force it. You know, if if DJ Giddens has, you know, seven carries to start a game and just it's not working, you don't have to give him five more to try and jumpstart him. You can throw another guy out there that you know can carry the load and get you over the hump for a little bit, and then you can try DJ Giddens again. And vice versa can happen. I mean, Treshawn Ward is going to have some games. He's already had it this year where he just wasn't going to be able to get it going. But DJ Giddens, as we know from the UCF game, he can do it. You can you can saddle it on him and he'll go. So it's a good thing that K-State has both of these guys. And they're right in the spot that we thought at the start of the season where everything is probably going to end up looking pretty equal for these two guys when all is said and done uh, at the end of the season because they're both talented. They're both very good. And they they both are going to have their moments for K State. Running back controversy. Yeah, for some reason this isn't as sexy of a topic, and I don't think it's as uh, as talked about. Why why is that? Um, DJ Gins is still he still has plenty more carries this year, but also that's because Ward missed an entire game. I bet if Treshawn Ward played against UCF, there's a chance K State has two guys go over 100 yards at running back in that game because they are bad against the run. And there's also a chance DJ Giddens doesn't touch the ball about 40 times. Very true. Yeah, yeah. Well, I can guarantee if both of them played and he touched the ball 40 times still, Chris Kleiman would be even more impressed with himself that he let DJ Giddens touch it that many times because uh, that happened. Uh, we all took the under on Treshawn Ward and his touches. That's just a, a sad fact. Okay. Uh, one where you and I are right, Drew is wrong, Ben Sinnott, four and a half catches. We both had the over. Uh, we talked about how the receivers were struggling. So the guy you got to get it to is Ben Sennett. He hauls in six catches, had a couple of big ones. Number one, he caught Avery Johnson's first pass of the game to kind of settle him in in the first half. And then he also caught one in the second quarter that was a big shot from Will Howard uh, during the course of the game that moved the ball down the field. And that led to K-State's first touch or second touchdown of the game where Avery Johnson finished it off in the end zone. So Ben Sennett was crucial in the game for the Wildcats. And in addition to that, it, it just highlights more of the struggles that we've seen from the receivers this season. Yeah. Well, the reason why I went with Ben Sinnott on top of the receivers not necessarily providing the production necessary was that he had 11 targets in the loss against Oklahoma State. 
you, you give me a guy that had 11 targets, he better have more than four and a half catches. Yeah. No, that's a, that's, that's a good point. So, uh, he, 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 he more than made up for it, had a good game against Texas tech and was a big part of what K state did because outside of him, only seven of the catches, uh, for K state on Saturday night came from receivers. And four of them came from Phillip Brooks, who deserves a mention because he made a nice play where he went up and got a ball, uh, and, and had a good game, at least from a receiving standpoint and doing some things. Obviously there are still some things there that you can question Phillip Brooks on and, and the blocking is one of them. Yeah. Also, RJ Garcia, one catch, eight yards, continues to kind of underwhelm a bit. Also, not on the depth chart this week. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. He and uh, he had one catch, and I, I was actually, you know, I thought it was impressive that he was able to hang on to it because he took a pretty good shot on it. Yeah. But the big catch in the game, Jace Brown, 21 yards from Avery Johnson. That, I mean, that had both things that you wanted to see as a K State fan, where it was Avery Johnson making the throw downfield. And I mean, it was a tricky throw, maybe a little bit of luck involved, but a whole lot of talent there. And Jace Brown being able to go up, get it, make a play. And Jace Brown, I mean, you said it after the game, but he, he blocked his tail off on Saturday night and he gave K-State two things that you want to see. And Chris Kleiman said it, it added more trust. And I'm sure we see uh, maybe a few more targets for him on Saturday against TCU than what we've seen uh, the, the first six games of the year. Avery Johnson said it's his best friend on the team. Uh if you're the best friend of the quarterback that you, and you play wide receiver, I'm guessing you got a good career coming. That's that's probably a good point. Jace Brown knew what he was doing, uh, be, becoming friends with Avery Johnson. Uh, final one, you got this one right. Drew and I got it wrong. The havoc rate of 19.5%. You took the under. Drew and I went over. Um, kind of like what I said, K-State – think did a pretty good job of plugging things up and not letting too many big plays go past them, but they just didn't get many of those stops behind the line of scrimmage. Uh, so you end up getting that. You had a good week. You pick up three wins, so you've got a game back, and you and I are tied for the lead. Drew slides back a little bit, only got one right. Yeah, that, I probably went on a little bit of a fluke there because <laughs> – I think part of the Havoc rate, man, I mean, they beat the crap out of that quarterback at three interceptions. I think the Havoc rate doesn't account for, I guess, when you hit the quarterback and affect the throw. Yeah. But obviously don't get a statistic recorded. I think that that's like a missing element because yeah. uh, I, I think Baron Morton and Jake Strong would, would raise their hand and be like, there was a lot of Havoc. <laughs> yeah. Yes, very true. Uh, and for those curious – uh, the havoc rate is just the the percentage of snaps with a tackle for loss, pass breakup, interception, or first fumble uh, in the in the game. But K State just not enough of those tackles for loss that went with it uh, throughout the course of the game and the sack numbers. I think K State only ended up totaling what two sacks in the game. Um, well, so. maybe one. I know Clyde Duke had one. It was uh, you know it was uh, Austin Romaine was credited with a sack in the game. Yeah. So oh, there you did go. Clint, Clint Duke got one. Who, yep. Well, I also think he's back on top in the Big 12 in sacks. And though it didn't come on the sack, his hit ultimately, I think, is what shook yeah. Bear Morton up the most. Yeah, it was it was the the play where Marquis Siegel dropped probably a pick yep. six. Yep. Uh Khalid Duke just demolished Baron Morton. It was right in front of me, and that's the play where I said, up, uh, Baron Morton got up woozy. And that's what made me think, you know, it maybe it was like later on diagnosed concussion like symptoms because I was like, I can't believe that they're not like taking a look at him. If it, if it was the NFL, the, the independent doctor or whatever is like, hey, you got to take a look at him at least. The two uh, rule. The two rule. Yeah. So we'll, we'll have to see uh, about that. But that's how it ended up playing out on uh, Saturday night. Real quick, obviously, the big topic of conversation is Will Howard, Avery Johnson. There's an or listed on the depth chart this week for him. If you want the in-depth breakdown of that and our thoughts, there is a separate breakout video where the only topic, 20 minutes straight of breaking down the quarterback situation at K-State. But just looking at what took place on Saturday night, if you're watching on the YouTube, the numbers are in front of you. Uh, but, you know, Will Howard was six of nine for 86 yards passing. He ended up not registering any rushing yards because of the sacks taking things out. No touchdowns, and his PFF grade was 68.8. Avery Johnson obviously graded out very high from PFF, 87.9, the best on the team. He was eight of nine passing for 77 yards and then had five touchdowns on the ground. 
and 90 rushing yards to go with it. So he had an awesome game. It feels like one of those seminal moments about uh, the, the season for K-State and maybe Avery Johnson and taking over. Who knows for how long, maybe permanently. We'll just have to see. Um, since we've already gone in depth on, you know, Will or Avery or how it's going to play out, D.Y., I will ask you this. What did you just take away from a performance like that from Avery Johnson since it was the first real game action he had seen? I mean, he saw a few snaps against Missouri, but it wasn't a ton, and he handled those fine. But this was kind of like the game is on you. Let's see what you got here. And he handled it flawlessly. And I think more impressive than anything, I mean, people can say that the the passing wasn't there and he's going to have to throw it more. All very true. But at the end of the day, for him to go out there and be eight of nine and look pretty solid, at least throwing the ball, I mean, some throws that could have been a little crisper, uh, that's pretty good for your first outing. And obviously he was so good with his legs and Treshawn Ward was good too. They didn't have to throw the ball a ton. So that's not something to complain too much about from this game. No, he didn't have to, and it's probably why they didn't. Going forward, they will have to let him uncork it because, one, and I know Texas Tech already did this to an extent, teams are going to sell out against it. They're going to take it away. Two, they do that. What's open is the pass play, to be quite honest. Um, And you'll have a better opportunity to throw the ball downfield a bit. And three, of why it's not necessarily a, a sustainable formula to run that much to have the run pass ratio like that is that you need to keep him healthy. Um, that needs to go into this a little bit at the end of the day. What I will say is that he's dangerous. He's a weapon. He was almost like the closer against Texas tech. And we'll find out soon, soon enough if he will be the starter versus TCU. Yeah. That'll be interesting to kind of keep tabs on and we'll see moving forward. Uh, it is the Horn Frogs this coming week for the Wildcats. And one thing to keep in mind, we saw how everything played out against Texas Tech. They came away with three interceptions. Uh, the Horn Frogs, who will come to Manhattan trying to get you know their revenge from the Big 12 title game from last year, a lot of different offensive pieces, but some same guys defensively. Offensively, though, Chandler Morris started the year. He's not available. He's out with an injury, and it – Maybe a situation where TCU was playing the wrong guy all along because the Horn Frogs had a massive day offensively against BYU. 44 points. Josh Hoover was 37 of 58 for 439 yards, four touchdowns, and two picks. Uh, how much of what the K State defense was able to do was real on Saturday against Texas Tech? And how much of it can translate to stopping a guy like Josh Hoover? who obviously is going to want to put the ball in the air a ton and proved he can already do it once against Big 12 competition. I still have to see more to believe in it. It sounds a little bit like a one-off situation when it comes to Hoover and TCU. That or, and I guess you can say this about Kansas State almost to a point now, is Sonny Dykes played, played the wrong quarterback for the second straight yeah. year. <laughs> Funny how both teams are going through that a little bit to – to different extents, I think it's probably more dramatic on the on the Horn Frogs thing is that they they continue to want Chandler Morris to be that guy. He continues to show that he is not that guy. So we'll see. I, Kansas State to seven open as a seven and a half point favorite. So I think the books tend to be a little bit wait and see on on Josh Hoover as well. Yep, yeah, and that's what we'll have to do. Uh, as we wait for everything to kind of play out and, and go on from there. That will do it for us on this edition of the KSO Show on this Monday, October 16th. Wildcats and Horn Frogs, the next game up. We will have the KSO Show for you on Wednesday, recapping what Chris Kleiman had to say in his Tuesday press conference. It is sure to be entertaining and interesting, given the circumstances with Avery Johnson and Will Howard as well as just K-State coming off of a win and getting ready to have back-to-back -back home games that set up for a major proving point in the middle of their season and will tell us if they are meant to contend for Arlington again or if they are just another one of these teams in the Big 12 that's going to cannibalize itself. And then Wednesday throughout the day, just to, to put this on everybody's radar, uh, we will be in Kansas City for Big 12 Media Basketball Day. It's going to be a, a fun time kind of getting to, to get into the flow of basketball season early mornings uh, there with Jerome Tang and the crew as he's the first one to speak at the podium 
on Wednesday morning. So that will be coming your way. And then regular Friday pregame stuff, Saturday game coverage, and Sunday with the KSO show with myself, Fan, and Drew. And uh, everything else you need going on over at K-State Online, on on three. Great recruiting coverage this week. A lot to kind of get into there. Friday night I'll be out here in Wichita uh, watching Derby play as uh, the Wildcats in pursuit of maybe the, the, the next and future Ben Sennett. So we'll see uh, how that goes down. And then also uh, plenty of other things going on with a, a pretty good visitor list this weekend. So take everything in that you can here at K-State Online, whether it's on the YouTube, the podcast feed, and at K-State Online with On3. That will do it for Derek Young. I am Mason Voth. Thanks for watching the KSO Show, and we'll talk to you again Wednesday.